Welcome to the Fall 2020 Ladies Big Book Study Recording Series. My name is Kimberly and I am a recovered alcoholic. I am the facilitator of a tri-weekly big book study for ladies only and we record each session so we can share the knowledge along with you. What we do is we read the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous line by line. We pause on each page and have discussion time to share our experience, our strength, and our hope on each page. You are more than welcome to follow along in this series and do the work of the steps of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you do need support at any time, please reach out to me in the Contact Us area of my YouTube channel and we're happy to provide you with support. The online recordings are open to men and women. Do not be discouraged, gentlemen. Our ladies' point of view may offer you a different perspective. So welcome. I hope you enjoy. Back the bus up. Let's try it again. Chapter 3, more about alcoholism. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. We know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. All of us felt at times we were regaining control, but such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grips of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. We are like men who have lost their legs. They never grow new ones. Neither does there appear to be any kind of treatment which will make alcoholics of our kind like other men. We have tried every imaginable remedy, in some instances, there has been brief recovery, followed always by a still worse relapse. Physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree that there is no such thing as making a normal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish this, but it hasn't done so yet. All right, so we are on step one. Um, so in that first paragraph and in the bit, little bit of the second paragraph, there are four words. Obsession, illusion, insanity, and delusion. They all describe the malady of the mind. So in that first paragraph, it says that most of us have been unwilling to admit we are real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. So there are the two symptoms of alcoholism, the two requirements of alcoholism, whatever you'd like to call them, bodily and mentally. So the bodily is the allergy. Once I ingest alcohol, I can cannot control how much I take. I get thirstier. I can never quench that thirst. I want more. Mentally is the malady of the mind. It is not the obsession of the mind. The obsession is just a little part of it. The malady is what some people call that built-in forgetter. I don't have a built-in forgetter. I remember everything, every word my ex-boyfriends have said to me. I don't forget. What I do is I have a disease that's cunning and baffling. It tricks me into telling myself that I don't have a disease. I have delusion. There is also an obsession that one day 
I may drink like other people, but that is part of the malady. It's myself trying to convince myself that I can drink like you. Not you, but you being regular people. Because I drink like you guys. Um, so that's a lot of the times we hear people are like, oh, the obsession's been lifted. Our obsession never gets lifted. I will always have an alcoholic mind. So to say my obsession's been lifted is completely false. My disease is always going to be cunning and baffling. It will always try to trick me into thinking that I'm not alcoholic and I can drink like normal people. That never will go away. So for people to say their obsession has been lifted is a very dangerous place to be because that's your disease tricking you because you're going to think you're okay. I have a daily reprieve from the obsession. I have a daily reprieve from my malady and my allergy, right? I, I've applied a spiritual solution to it. Um, so it's very important that we realize that these things don't get lifted. We have a reprieve because um, people, we grab words. You give an alcoholic a word and we're going to wrap our minds around it and twist it because our disease is a disease that lies to us. The second paragraph is super, super, super important. I have it highlighted, underlined, and second highlighted. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. I think that is the most important sentence in the book. The whole book. Why? If you do not fully concede to yourself that you are an alcoholic, you will relapse. 100% you will pick up another drink. We can't accept that we're alcoholic. We can't surrender to our disease because that's leaving a window open for us to convince ourselves that at this time it's going to be different. I have conceded to my innermost self that I am alcoholic. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I have this and there's nothing I can do to change that. There is not a pill I can take, there is not a program that will change the fact that I am alcoholic. I have conceded to my innermost self that I am alcoholic. And that wording is very important. And I'm going to use a really weird example. But if you think of the First and Second World Wars, and I know people that have been here before have heard it. In the First World War, Hitler surrendered. What did he do? He went back to Germany. He regrouped. He built a stronger army. And he came back and tried again. The second time he conceded defeat, he had no other options, he was hooped, he was done. So the difference there is, for an alcoholic, if I surrender, I'm going to be like, well, maybe I don't need Alcoholics Anonymous. Maybe I need a new car, a hotter girlfriend, a stable job, and, and to take this magic little pill, or do yoga. Or maybe if I, I got rid of the toxic people in my life and said these affirmations and bought some crystals, right? If I surrender, I'm not admitting complete defeat. If I concede to my innermost self, I have admitted to myself that I'm fucked. Without this program of action or something else, I am going to drink again. That is what we need to realize. I am an alcoholic. And if I don't do something about it, I will drink again. Very, very important. And then it talks about, you know, all these things where we regain control, but we get an interval, usually brief, followed by even less control. You hear that at the podium in rooms each and time. Oh, I had six months sobriety, life was great, and then I relapsed, and oh, I relapsed for two years. And then the same person relapses again after four months, uh, and they are only relapse for two months and it was worse and then they relapse again and they come back and it was two weeks and they burnt their life to the ground and then they relapse again and in two days they're homeless without any money doing crack cocaine on wherever they do that's what our disease does but and you hear this one too 
oh, I was five. And you hear it a lot at 10-year cakes. You want it? I'm a stats girl. You know I'm a stats girl. You hear, oh, I got five, six years sober. I, I got married. I had a great job. I had a great fellowship. And I stepped away to live my amazing life. And now I'm coming back because my life's hell at nine or 10 years sober. If by luck of God that they make it back and they don't relapse. Six to nine years of sobriety, danger zone. You get comfy, cozy danger zone. Um, that's just from a girl who does stats. All right, let's go to the hands and get some more input. Fern. Hi everyone, I'm Fern and I'm an alcoholic. So um, I was just, uh, I was determined today to share because I realized I wasn't being honest by not sharing. And I'm, I'm definitely what you said, Kimberly, in that category of uh, I had, I was so super AA and so plugged into the program and um, had done everything, belonged to, you know, doing tons of service. My whole life revolved around AA and, and, uh, and then, you know, a series of events happened and uh, I walked, I basically moved and walked away from AA and it's really hard to connect. I'm coming up to my 12th birthday and I have stayed sober, but my thinking has gone in the toilet. Well, it's not really gone into the toilet, but, but I am mentally different. I am a, a, and bodily different. And um, without the program, without sharing how I honestly feel, and, and I couldn't share at first, and I know you mentioned something about sharing on here before, at the beginning, but you know, those thoughts are in your head, like, oh, I, I don't have anything to say. I haven't been to a meeting in however long. And, and, uh, and you know, feeling less than, and how could I feel less than you alcoholics? But I do. And uh, that's my crazy thinking. My thoughts are, when I, when I think about going to a meeting at night, oh, I, I don't know what, oh, I have to go to bed. Um, oh, whatever. And it's those thoughts that will take me. And uh, I have a very dear friend who got me into this meeting, and she uh, she went out at 22 years after being Miss Super AA, and you know, was couldn't reach out, couldn't ask for help, and so here I am. Thanks. Thank you so much. And and I like to use the example of someone who's on medicine, and the medicine makes you feel good, so you think you're good, and then you stop taking the medicine. And you get a little bit crazy. Well, it's because that's why you feel good. You know, I feel great because of the service I do, because of the way I'm in the book, because of my amazing connection to God. So if I if I forget, I'm constantly reminding myself, thank God for this amazing life. Thank AA for this amazing life. I could not have gotten this amazing life that I'm living on my own. And I think that's that's the one stat I picked up from hearing people like you, Fern, who shared I got I got everything and then things happened and I step away. And it's a very important, important thing to learn is we've got this amazing gift and we get all of these amazing things back because of what we've done. Um, and, and so like that's first and foremost in my mind. Like today... I could easily crawled in my bed and said, I'm having a bad day. I'm not doing the line by line. But I feel great now. I feel great because that's how this works. I talk about it. I do what I do. And everything's going to be okay. But, you know, it's, we run that risk of just falling into self-pity. Kelly D. Hi, my name is Kelly. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Kim. I love the the stuff behind your head that take the risk or lose the chance. Lady boss, work hard and stay humble. I love it. It's awesome. Okay, so with me, I, I wrote uh, with big black letters. Now, my book is falling apart, too. Like, my book is fate. Like, so I had to get a new book. So I'm doing a new book now with you. And I put illusion to see something that's not there. And I didn't think I had a problem after a couple of days. Um, and it gives you the, the, the definition right here. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. You know, it's, it's right 
it's in the book. I love that everything's just in the book. And I just needed you to explain, like you talked about the two symptoms. There's the bodily, the mentally, and then the malady. And you talked about the obsession. So um, I just w- would really like it if you just talk about that again, if you can, just briefly, because I was writing down bodily and then I'm like mentally, the twisted thinking. And yeah. I'm thinking that's- yeah. Okay. So Thanks. the two symptoms of alcoholism are bodily and mentally. So malady of the mind, cunning, baffling, powerful. We trick ourselves into thinking we don't have this disease. We think we can drink like other people after stopping for a while. Or we try to, you know, well, if I only do one drink and I don't do this and I have water in between and I make sure I eat a salad first, it's going to be different this time. That's malady. That's crazy, insane thinking. Bodily is the allergy. Once I take alcohol into my body, it sets off a reaction where I want more. I cannot handle alcohol the way other people. I drink more than I meant to drink because once I take it, I can't control how much I put into my body. I get thirstier. That one, I've had that for so long and I didn't know what it was. The spiritual malady, completely separate thing. And we'll talk about that in great length when we get to step four in chapter five. But in essence, spiritual maladies are common to any human being, right? Just because someone is a serial killer, they have a spiritual malady, it doesn't make them an alcoholic. They don't have the malady and the the allergy, right? But they, they are spiritually sick. They have a spiritual malady, right? So that's separate. It stems from resentment for alcoholics. So if you want to picture it, I love my example of the two neighbor ladies. So, you know, let's call one Betty and one Joan. Betty and Joan are neighbors. Betty and Joan's husbands both go out and cheat on them. What happens? Betty's an alcoholic and Joan isn't. Friday night, they both go out on a bender because their husbands are cheating jerks. What happens is Betty sets off the allergy so she can't control how much she drinks. Joan lets off a little steam, goes home, nurses her hangover, calls her counselor, calls her pastor, calls her lawyer, and by Monday is looking for a new place to live and has packed up her stuff. Betty, she's probably still drinking. She's festering in resentment. She's probably burned his clothes on the front lawn and keyed his truck and has gossiped to everyone in town about her situation. They both were suffering from a spiritual malady when they went out Friday night. But what Betty did was she triggered her alcoholism. So does that help clear it up, the the difference? Okay. Yvette, good morning. Hi, Kimberly. Hi, ladies. You've had alcoholic. I'm definitely a Betty. I'm grateful to know that today. Yeah, chapter three. Oh, my gosh. That was all of 164 in the big book, but that was life-saving. That was actually the first part of the big book that I read. The ladies at the detox in Wooden Hills, California. I got there broken, you know. And um, and I was like, I am. Hey, look, we had the morning meeting in our pajamas, and you say your name and the nature of your disease. I smoked a lot of cigarettes, a lot of coffee. Got to do that. I was excited about that. Anyway, so the, I said, I'm crazy, sure, a little bit, you know, suicidal for sure, little homicidal, you know, I'm depressed, but I am not an alcoholic. And so they said, okay, you know, go upstairs. Here's the big book. Why don't you read this and come back down later. And I came back down and I was in tears. It was like the big book was written for me. I was highlights. I'm even an alcoholic. And that was the biggest share I've ever had and ever will. And I don't graduate, graduate one day at a time like Kimberly said and Thank God for AA. It was like a solution I didn't even know existed. So not to go on and on, but I can with chapter three to concede to our innermost selves is so important. And, um, 
Yeah, it's jails, institutions, or death, or recovery. Right? There's a fourth one. So for one day at a time, I choose that. And in, in the big book somewhere, it says a thimble full of alcohol. And that's all it takes to trigger that. So that's a, a good thing. And then it's interesting to my, I was like, what about non-alcoholic beer? And thank God for sponsors. My sponsor's like, non-alcoholic beer is for non-alcoholics. You're an alcoholic. So welcome home. Love you guys. Thank you Got so it. much. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that my very first meeting, the very first time I stood up and said, my name is Kim and I'm an alcoholic, I had conceded to my innermost self that moment. I didn't complete step one for two more years, but I felt that that feeling come over me of like, oh my God, it makes sense. Like there's an answer for all of my behavior for the past 20 years. This is it. And it was like you said, like just tears like, oh, okay. But then it took me two more years to figure it all out. Uh, Trish. Hi, my name is Betty and I'm an alcoholic. I should say <laughs> Trish and I'm an alcoholic. Oh, I'm so enjoying these shares. Thank you, everyone. It's just absolutely amazing to learn more about myself. Every, every meeting and every time, this is the second time doing this lines with you guys and oh my goodness the melody you just learn new words melody and we know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control all this stuff is just helping me so much deep inside um there's just so many reasons why i, I want to be here with you girls all of the meetings it's just amazing Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks, Trish. All right. Page 31. Despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholics are not going to believe they are in this class. By every form of self-deception and experimentation, they will try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. If anyone who is showing inability to control his drinking can do the right about face and drink like a gentleman, our hats are off to him. Heaven knows we have tried hard enough and long enough to drink like other people. Here are some of the methods we have tried. Drinking beer only. Limiting the number of drinks. Never drinking alone. Never drinking in the morning. Drinking only at home. Never having it in the house. Never drinking during business hours. Drinking only at parties. Switching from scotch to brandy. Drinking only natural wines. Agreeing to resign if ever drunk on the job. Taking a trip. Not taking the trip. Swearing off forever with and without a solemn oath. Taking more physical exercise. Reading inspirational books going to health farms and sanitariums, accepting voluntary commitment to asylums, we could increase the list ad infinitum. We do not like to pronounce any individual as alcoholic, but you can quickly diagnose yourself. Step over to the nearest bar room and try some controlled drinking. Try to drink and stop abruptly more than once. Or try it more than once. It will not take long for you to decide if you are honest with yourselves about it. It may be worth a bad case of jitters if you get a full knowledge of your condition. So yeah, self-deception and experimentation, also known as a little bit of delusion. Um, I, you know, we can add not drinking or on a on an empty stomach that that my favorite drinking water in between every drinks not drinking those sugary drinks because it's the sugar that's the problem not the alcohol don't you know um but like we could we could add to that list for hours but the tr thing is even though we say our our crazy thinking comes back and we're like well Maybe it's different once I have that. I'm only going to drink beer this time, but I'm two beers in and it's going okay. I think I'm going to go for the gin. 
right? Like we, even though we try these methods, oh, we, we, we get that self-deception in there real quick and we start changing the rules of our own game. You know, how many times did I, I'm only taking $20 to the bar. Knowing damn well I've got a low-cut shirt on and I'm going to get like however many drinks I want because I'm going to flirt with whatever person is going to buy me drinks, right? Um, but again, at the bottom, I love, we, we are self-diagnosed. It is not my job to diagnose an alcoholic. I qualify alcoholics in sponsorship based on experience. I've worked with a lot of women. I've had a lot of different scenarios. So I can I can be a pretty good judge to qualify a prospect whether or not they're ready to work with me or not. That takes practice. That's a skill that we we hone as we go working this program. 2 years ago I sucked. I was trying to save everybody who thought they had a drinking problem and they just it, it was a disaster. But I've learned from that experience and I'm able to qualify now, um, which is a lot different than diagnosing. If you tell me you're an alcoholic and you want to get better, I'm going to show you what I've done and it's up to you. But I'm not going to say, I don't think you're alcoholic. It's not my job. I, I can say, I don't think I'm the right fit for you at this time. But here's a couple other girls. Maybe they'll, they'll be the right fit for you. Um, and that's good verbiage to use. So not to hurt anyone's feelings. Um, and it's just a simple, I don't think we're the right fit. When I say that, if I've said that to anybody, I apologize. But it usually means that I don't think you're ready. Um, you know, because like, you can tell after a little bit in this program. All right, let's go to the hands. Lee, I apologize. I saw your hand come up right when I started to read last time, but go ahead. Okay, there you okay. go. So I'm I'm Lee and I'm an alcoholic and I'm sorry too because it takes me a while to, to get my thoughts together. So all of a sudden it was like, oh God, we're reading again. So so I'm really sorry about that. But um, did I just introduce myself as an alcoholic? Um, when I when I first came into the program, I said those words. I my my name is Lee and I'm an alcoholic and I didn't believe it. I thought I was an imposter in this program that I was coming here, I didn't even know why in a way, but when I, as I reflected over the years, over the, and it took years to get through that step one to the point where I was like, yep, it is true. And I'm uh, somehow, you know, I think to myself, oh my God, I'm sort of embarrassed that it took me so long to get there. But when that penny dropped, it did drop. And uh, listening to the word concede right now is a very comfortable word. Because that's what happened when the process kept going. I kept, well, what is your story? What is your story? What did happen? How come you, because I feel that God was there the day that I said to somebody, oh, I heard from, in a meeting at one time, it was not an AA meeting, you are an alcoholic. And that person said to me, yes, I am. And I went, I think I need your help. That's how it all started for me, uh, you know, getting on the road to recovery. But God, it took a long time to get not only in the rooms to really understand what was going on, what was going on for me, what was going on for all of you. And it was really, a, you know, it's, a, it's an exciting process. But for me, on some level, it's, it's taken a long time if that's how it feels. So yeah. anyway, that's all I wanted to say was, yeah. Thank you so much, Lee. And, and you know, and it's different for everybody. And I think myself as fortunate because I had never had anyone tell me, you got a drinking problem, you need to slow down. Nobody ever did that to me. So when I came in, I didn't have prejudice and I didn't have a wall up against it. And I just kind of sat and I'm like, oh, shoot, this is my problem. The problem with me is nobody grabbed on to me and showed me what, what this was. And so all I thought was step one, I'm powerless over alcohol, my life's unmanageable. I'm like, my life is unmanageable. Oh yeah, I'm powerless. Yeah, I'm an alcoholic. That's as far as I got. So that limited step one kept me sober. Um, but there's so much more to it that we're going through. Linda. 
You're unmuted. Yeah, uh, good morning. My name is Linda, and I'm an alcoholic. You know, even till even still today, I feel lost. You know, like I I would go to the bar, skipping, dr telling myself I was an alcoholic, because I would make sure I was there when it opened, stay till it closed, blacked out drinker. You know, falling down, stupid, losing everything. But, you know, just being told you're an alcoholic and not understanding alcoholism, which I still don't today, you know, when you say that, you know, those that are real alcoholics are still going to believe that they're, I'm not in that class, even though I haven't had a drink, you know, because I have no connection to that or understanding of that bodily and mentally. Like, I even lost what you said. Like, I didn't understand what you, you said about that. So, you know, I, I've gone through this program these umpteen years and don't have a clue about alcoholism. Okay, what? And I wonder, and wonder why, you know, I'm so unhappy. Okay, what what part do you not understand about it? Well, all I, all I wrote down was bodily and mentally. Bodily and mentally what? Okay, so when you drink... Because bodily is the allergy. So when I drink, I crave more. I want more. Okay. So that's, that's, that's called the allergy. So when I ingest alcohol, my body has an, a reaction where I want more to drink. I drink faster than my fellows. So if yeah. I'm at a dinner party with four girls, I finish yeah. a bottle of wine ten times faster than them. I, yeah. I can't stop drinking once I start. I, I, I want more and more and more and more and more. Does that make sense? Okay. okay? Yeah. The, the, the mental is called the malady of the mind, where I tell myself it's going to be different this time. Right? So okay. Okay. I have a hangover in the morning, and I say I'm never, ever, ever, ever drinking again. Yeah. And then that night, I'm going <laughs> to a baseball game or a hockey game, and I've forgotten the suffering from the morning. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I can just have one beer. Yeah. And then what happens? I have that one beer and I have another. And then it's off to the races and I'm doing shooters. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then so again, I say, I'm never, ever, ever going to do that again. Yeah. And then suddenly I find myself drinking for no reason. I don't, I don't want to forget that I'm alcoholic just because I haven't drank these many years. You know, I have to go out and prove to myself that I'm still alcoholic just because I haven't drank. No. So that's where we get on that page 30. I've conceded to my innermost self that I'm alcoholic. I have this thing, so no further experimentation is required. Yeah. I know based on my drinking career yeah. that I, I'm meant to be here. Yeah, I like intele I could intellectualize that, but I could sit here and tell myself, "So why can't I drink?" Yeah, you know, after this many years. So we talked about that. So we talked about that earlier. So basically, think of it like a cucumber. Once you've pickled the cucumber, it's a pickle. <laughs> you can't go back, right? Yeah. How I became pickled, I don't know. But I just have to concede to myself that I'm a pickle. pickle. And it's never going to change. Okay. Right? Okay. And so, but, but a lot of people, right? And this is why we have the daily reprieve. A lot of people, like yourself, think, well, I've been sober a really long time. Maybe it will be different this time. Yeah. That's part of the mental. Our, our brain trying to convince us that it's going to be different. Or another one is, I have a really good job right now. I have a really stable home. All my bills are paid. I have no problems. My relationship is wonderful. So this time, it's going to be different. That's also the mental. But what we have to remember, I'm a fucking pickle. Yeah. Okay. I can't run around pretending I'm a cucumber. Yeah. So that's conceding to my innermost self. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay. 
I don't know what the order was anymore. So Jenny D. Nope, you're muted. <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go. Oh, well, I was last, so I apologize to Lois and Kelly for oh. jumping in there. <laughs> uh, but I just, um, first of all, uh, when Linda was talking there about, um, you know, being sober a long time, and I just, there's, there's quite a few, there's a number of us that come to this meeting that have been sober for, like you said, umpteen number of years. And my, my sobriety was fine. It was good. I wasn't unhappy. I was happy. Um, I was doing the, I don't know, sponsoring and doing the stuff and whatever. I wasn't feeling like I was having a bad life at all. But I got to tell you, and I know a lot of the other people I'm looking right now feel exactly the same way. This big book study has changed the way I um look at my sobriety and the way I work my program and the way I can help others and um, which is why there's a lot of us here that have been sober for a long time and we're going through our second round of this thing because um, just because of the changes that it has made so I just wanted to uh, pass that on for some of the new people it's fucking magical I'll tell you <laughs> and I also think that for our group, for our ladies line by line, we have, Kim, you need to make us all t-shirts that says, I'm Betty and I'm a pickle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Betty. <laughs> Guys, I'm a Betty and I'm a pickle. <laughs> oh, gosh. Thank you. Lois. And the problem is that Zoom has changed. So people like pop up over here and then they move over there. Little old pickled Lois over here. <laughs> the uh, you know, and this this is what I did. I did every form of self deception and experimentation. I was a a periodic drinker, so I didn't drink every day. But when it would, it just seemed like when I did, I would fool myself into believing that it was going to be different this time, and every time was unpredictable. Every time I just couldn't stop and I couldn't figure that out because I would stop for long periods of time. But when that out, when I took that first drink and the allergy came in and kicked in, that's when my trouble started. And I, and I, it took me a long time to realize that I came in believing, well, I came in through the court system. First of all, they, the state of Florida didn't like the way I drove when I drank. So you know, they, they gave me a few DUIs and, uh, you know, so I, so I, I had to, I had to concede. I really had to concede and believe that the people in these rooms were doing a lot better than I was. My life was unmanageable. So I needed to hang on and just listen to what the people were saying. I didn't do it perfectly. I certainly had a lot of um, ups and downs because it, it was like little baby steps. Like I'd take a step and it would work. So I would try something else, but then I would retreat back to my old ways and I would, I would have some kind of poor decision or something. So it would, it, but it took me a while. But when I started doing this, like, um, like Jenny said, when I started doing line by line and understanding because you put it so perfectly, you put it in, in like down to earth kind of language so that I could, I could relate to another person, the same verbiage that you're using, you know, which makes it a lot easier for us to be a sponsor. So thanks for letting me share. Thanks Lois. Yeah. I don't like to use terms that are hard to understand. Um, you know, especially in Alcoholics Anonymous, all we come from such varied backgrounds. Um, some are, are, you know, university scholars and some have never finished high school. Um, and so, you know, we have to make it relatable. And, and when you're talking to people, 
try to talk on their level. I mean, I can talk to people who are professionals and, and I don't swear. I mean, we got Jenny D to swear today. That's amazing. Um, but, you know, if I'm talking to someone who's grown up on the streets, I'm going to talk to them a lot differently than I'm going to talk to um, someone who's a professional or who's, you know, got a PhD. Um, and that's just kind of a weird skill set I've acquired. Kelly. Hi, my name is Kelly. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you so much for bringing up the methods. Ooh, I was a method girl. Um, for some reason, I always ended up $800 in sufficient funds. What, what happened? <laughs> Just going to go out and have one beer. Just going to go have one bump or line of Coke. That's it. That's all I'm going to do. But not, uh, be Friday night. Come back Monday morning with the walk of shame. Um, and I hated that walk of shame because it was like, oh, who are you? You looked cute, but you're not anymore. Um, anyway, all right, shh. All right, I'll come in a minute. Anyway, um, it's just great hearing that, and I just I like that you say that we have a daily reprieve because I don't want to forget that girl. And I have I'm in my um a, like I just celebrate eleven years May third, oh nine is my sobriety, and I had that weird thing that you said the six to nine. And I moved in my eighth year and it was very, like, it was like bizarre, like this new town, like it was outer space, like, no, get your ass to AA. So anyway, and I did, and I feel great now. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, everybody. I got to leave, but um, I'll see you guys Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And, and it is, it's funny when you, when you move or if you travel and you walk into an AA meeting. They know you're not from the area, but they know you're not new. I've had that because the, the way you walk into the room, because I, I, before COVID, I traveled a lot and I would travel and I would check out AA meetings and I'd walk in and it's like, hi, hi. They're like, you're not from around here, but it's not your first time here. I'm like, exactly. I said, I'm visiting. And it's, yeah. Say you're visiting. You always get called to share. Uh, Marianne Toronto. Hi friends, I am an alcoholic from Toronto. My name is Marianne. Grateful to be here. Grateful to be sober today. Controlled drinking. Did you ever have one and a half drinks, Marianne? Did you ever leave a half a glass of wine, Marianne? That was that was my answer right there. I must have had a weird look on my face about controlled drinking because somebody had me put up one and a half drinks. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. I remember I was dating a guy and we went out for his birthday and he had a single gin and tonic. I was like, do they even sell them in singles? I thought doubles were always gin. Like, like, do they sell those in a single pack? Weird. <laughs> I told you the Thanksgiving story of my daughter and her mug of wine. That was just bizarre. All right, page 32. Though there was no way of proving it, we believe that early in our drinking careers, most of us could have stopped drinking. But the difficulty is that few alcoholics have enough desire to stop where there is yet time. We have heard of a few instances where people who showed definite signs of alcoholism were able to stop for a long period because of an overpowering desire to do so. Here is one. A man of 30 was doing a great deal of spree drinking. He was very nervous in the morning after these bouts and quieted himself with more liquor. He was ambitious to succeed in business, but saw that he could get nowhere if he drank at all. Once he started, he had no control whatever. He made up his mind that until he had been successful in business and had retired, he would not touch another drop. An exceptional man, he remained bone dry for 25 years and retired at the age of 55 after a successful and happy business career. Then he fell victim to a belief which practically every alcoholic has that his long period of sobriety and self-discipline had qualified him to drink as other men. Out came his carpet slippers and a bottle. In two months, he was in hospital puzzled and humiliated. He tried to regulate his drinking for a while, making several trips to the hospital meantime. Then, gathering all his forces, he attempted to stop altogether and found he could not. Every means of solving his problems which money could buy was at his disposal. 
every attempt had failed. Though a robust man at retirement, he went to pieces quickly and was dead within four years. This case contains a powerful lesson. Most of us had believed that if we remained sober for a long stretch, we could thereby drink normally. But here is a man who at 55 years found he was just where he had left off at 30. We have seen the truth demonstrated again and again. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Commencing to drink after a period of sobriety, we are in a short time as bad as ever. If we are planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation of any kind, nor any lurking notion that someday we will be immune to alcohol. That last paragraph highlighted, underlined, double underlined that last sentence and circled must. So the last paragraph is highlighted and underlined, and the last sentence is double underlined, and must is circled. Then in the side, there's a big, huge star, and stop, fail. That's what it looks like in my book. And we'll talk about why after we talk about our good friend, the man of 30. Um, so... This is one of these things where I've like said, I'm an analyst, I'm a stats girl, I've listened for stats, and you hear this a lot, and we've talked about it today already. People who have stopped drinking for a period of time, they think life is different, they pick up, life goes to shit real fast. Um, this man of 30, in my analysis, and everybody can have a different analysis of it, but my take on this is, he had the allergy. He had the allergy. It speaks to it when it says that once he started, he had no control whatsoever. He, like myself, had never tried to stop. So here, he doesn't, to me, express that he has the malady of the mind. That once he starts, he can't stop. He has the allergy for sure. So what happens he stops drinking because he had a reasonable reason to do so. Work. Oh, but it sounds like, like my story, he just found another solution than using alcohol. He became a workaholic. Me, I, I, you know, I have lots. Gambling, workaholic, men, you name it. Shopping. I put all sorts of different band-aids on when I wasn't drinking. My first year of sobriety, I had all the gym. Oh, I loved going to the gym. That was that was good. So there's the other things that we can use. We're just a dry drunk. Doesn't sound like he was super happy, joyous, and free. Sounds like he was a workaholic. So he retired after a successful career, and he thought, because here, here now is the malady creeping in because he's been dry, not in a daily reprieve. So now he's convinced himself, well, look, I'm, I successfully stopped drinking for my career. I finished a successful career. How am I going to spend my entire retirement? I'm going to enjoy it. And he picks up the bottle, and what does he find out? He finds out very quickly that his disease progressed while he was dry, and now he cannot stop. And the malady has taken hold. He's bodily and mentally affected. Um, and what happened? He was dead in four years. Four years. Nowadays, with everything else that everybody does, it doesn't take four years anymore for people to die. People are not just doing alcohol. People leave this program and they're dead now. COVID's only been six months. I've lost all over 100 people in the fellowship in my area. Well over. My home group, half gone. One just came back on Saturday. She has a day sober. Toast. Life gone. Starting from scratch. That's what happens to our disease. This powerful lesson. Once we have been sober, we are not immune to alcohol. We are not cured. We were just dry. The stop fail here is very important. 
we must have no lurking notions or reservations. None. I am an alcoholic. If I drink, I die. If you add a but, if, and, or anything else to the end of that question or statement, you have a lurking notion and a reservation. And if you hear someone and they're talking to you, they're like, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict, and, you know, I really need to get sober, but I need my cell phone before I go to treatment. I need a big old fly swatter for those people. Or, but I have a boyfriend. But my children... Your children need you alive. That's the, that's like these, what, what, how is that uh, something keeping you from getting sober? You're going to die. So if you don't concede that you are alcoholic and to drink is to die, you need to get rid of the second half of that statement. If you are at page 33 halfway down and you have some other addition to that statement, you need to get rid of it right now. If someone has an addition to that statement when I'm sponsoring, I stop here until it's gone. Because if someone still is holding on to something, everything else in this book means shit. It will not work. If you do not concede to your innermost self that you are an alcoholic and you will die with a period at the end, do not continue on in this book. People think that's harsh, and it is, but I'm going to tell you why. There is a thousand other people behind them in line who don't have another statement that deserve to live too. But your boyfriend, but your kids, but your cell phone, but what? You will die if you do not concede that you are alcoholic. And I say that and I sound really harsh, but it is true. Half of the fellowship that I know in Vancouver is dead or dying right now because they had a lurking notion or a reservation. It's, it's just the way it is. All right, Annette, sorry. Cheery oh, up, no, cheery okay. on up that one. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks, I'm Annette, and I'm an alcoholic. I am so, so grateful for the people who do come back uh, and and tell me what it was like out there. And and I was so fortunate to have uh, when I was early, you know, when I first came into the program, that there was a man, and I can see his face. I can't remember his name, but um, and I thought, oh my, he had seven years and I thought, oh my God, you know, I, you know, I'm trying to work on like seven days. Right. And I just thought that's gotta be a lifetime. And, you know, okay, well, then he kind of disappeared. Well, he came fine. He finally came back and he said, I want to tell you, he goes, this is what it means that the disease progresses. And I still always had a hard time with that, but he said seven years sober, he then had that no defense against the first drink and he went out he said within two weeks he was in the dt's strapped to a gurney and he said he never had the dt's before you know before when he came in and he was in the dt's strapped to a gurney in the hospital and he said and i'll also tell you he said you ain't you know praying to any freaking mountain or electric light bulb he said you're asking a higher power you're asking god for help and I still, you know, I still remember how powerful that story was. And so many come back, you know, and will share that. And I thank them from the bottom of my heart because that helps me really believe there. I cannot have any lurking notion for me for this alcoholic. So that's all I want to say. Thanks. Absolutely. And if they have a lurking notion, tell them to go explore it. Seriously, it sounds awful. But there is no hug, no pat on the back, no sentence you are going to be able to say to them that is going to get rid of that lurking notion. Literally, go try it. Call me if you make it. I had a girl and her lurking notion was that she had never tried that psychedelic DBT or whatever it's called. I said, go try it. She tried it. Guess what? Didn't get her sober. She held on to intellectual ideas for a little bit longer. Now she's sober. You will not get sober if that is sitting in the back of your head. It will grow. 
a lurking notion will grow. And what it will grow into is a drink. Um, they, It's like a, a little bug in there. And all it does is it, and it's, it, it'll keep you sick, 100%. Marianne Toronto? Um, I just wanted to say, I don't have Stopdale. I have smashed this home yep. next to this paragraph. And I think you did that very well. So thank you for teaching me today how to do that. Appreciate it. Thank you. People say it's harsh. It's not harsh. This is life or death. Maybe that is what they need. I, I can't be like, oh, just stick around. It's going to be okay. It doesn't, it's... It's not going to be okay. You are going to drink and to drink is to die. You know, it, it's, that's, that's what we're facing here. Someone had their hand up and they disappeared. You can unmute. That was me. Go ahead. I know it's a little after three. And oh, it's okay. So, uh, first I just want to, I'll, I'll keep this short, but I just, and that I, I, fantastic. I agree. I mean, I've seen people, you know, I'm fortunate enough to come into this program and, um, you know, I, the people that I've seen that have gone back out even years later where, you know, they became very successful and I've run into them in the hospital and I've seen what happens when you go back out again. And so I always, you know, it was said to me and you know, I know I have another drink in me. I don't know if I'll ever have another recovery in me. So I try to always, you know, the first drink will get you drunk and stick close to the program. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, think of how hard it was just to get here. It's 10 times harder the next time and 10 times harder the next time. And, and, and then you get a big ball of all these doubts and this doesn't work and resentments and your onion and your like just think of a yarn ball or an elastic ball you know you've got a little tiny ball that you're peeling things off the more layers you put on that the more you have to break down next time you come back it's easier to stay than it is to leave let me tell you I've witnessed it that girl on Saturday night watching her come back oh yeah Lee. Uh, Lee, alcoholic. I, I really have a question for you about this because earlier you were talking about understanding that alcohol is the thing that you cannot do. And you and for myself, I really realized that over all the years. And I really am very comfortable with that. But I have other things. And you mentioned some of those things, the shopping, the uh, gambling, the whatever else you were talking about, that those things disappear for you after you get way more solid with your program? Yep, absolutely. Think of it as this. What's going to kill you first? <laughs> right? What's going to kill you first? I can handle a little bit of gym obsession because it's not going to kill me. I can handle a little bit of shopping because it's not going to kill me. What happens is we take away what's going to kill us first and then we can peel away the rest of the onion after that. Now, I don't have any of those anymore. Shopping was probably the last one and it was. It was justifying and it was if I had a bad day, I would buy something to make myself feel better. I can honestly tell you today that's all gone. And I mean, some people know I do my scratch and win tickets on a Friday night it's it's fun now. I don't I don't have any weird gambling at all. I've all of those vices have been gone. Uh, you know what? Men was probably a bit after shopping, or they were tied. But yeah, you know, like even my breakup last week, right? It's there's no fear. There's and that's what it is. There's no self esteem issues. There's no fear issues. There's mutual love and respect where it was like, this isn't the right fit and I'm able to move on. There was no manipulation, no weird stuff happening. Whereas before, the men thing would have been an issue. So men and shopping were probably my last two to go. But now I have nothing. Like I, I'm, I have peace. Right? And I'm already over the cat thing. So I, things get resolved easier when you have that reliance and the program to fall back on. 
But yeah, definitely get rid of the ones that are going to kill you first. Alcohol and drugs, cigarettes, then coffee, but you know, whatever. Wendy, oh no, Angie was first, Angie. Angie C? Yeah, I'm Angie, um, and I'm an alcoholic, and this has really, really helped me. I was sober for seven years, and uh, recently, um, um, well, not recently, for the past two years, I've um, went back out. And, you know, I'm uh, going through the big book, um, you know, I never understood allergy, really what that meant, and also this uh, amount how did you say it? Manali or malady lady or yeah. Uh, <laughs> malady. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing that you said that really, really helped me is that, you know, we alcoholics, we take a word and we twist it. Um, you know, and that's me, you know, when I, you know, I, when I first came in this program, I didn't like saying, you know, I was an alcoholic, you know, I had, uh, that's name calling. You know, that's, um, you know, classifying people. That's just, you know, um, and that's wrong. You know, even calling myself an alcoholic, you know, would be prejudiced against someone um, or myself. And, um, you know, and, and I struggle with that in the sense that, you know, I could go all week long, you know, um, and, and I can mail uh, without drinking. But then on Friday night, you know, it's like this person said this to me and that was wrong. That, you know, I'm going to set them straight. I'm going to get on Facebook and I'm going to tell them, you know, how they're doing this, you know, and this, you know, person should be president or this person. And, um, yeah, I am. And, and I have, uh, you know, on Friday night. You know, I say, I'll just drink two glasses of wine to calm me down, you know, just to get me out of that, um, just pressure cooker. And then I, I drink two and then, um, and then I could convince myself that, um, that I'm having a spiritual awakening, you know, as far as I know. You know, I start praying to God, you know, help me with this, help me with that, help me, da, 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 help me talk to this person the right way or, you know, and then I go through just beating myself up. And then at that point, I want to die. You know, I mean, people will say, and, and I've had a hard time with this with AA because, um, you know, it's like nobody's going to know you know, except my husband who, who doesn't think I'm an alcoholic, who, you know, who continues to drink, you know, um, and, you know, um, he'll, he'll say, don't drink it like Gatorade. Don't drink it like, you know, drink one and then have a glass of, you know, glass of water, you know, or, um, you know, so, in, but it's, it's, it's hard for me to imagine. I mean, somebody said on the program that, until I get to the point where I think, yeah, I don't want to die. You know, I, I really don't want to die because I had, you know, what brought me in this program, I had cancer. And then when I was taking chemo, I lost my job and it was a big, big ass job. And uh, I just started drinking and drinking and, um, and, and then, you know, but then I, I come to the conclusion that, if I just drink on Friday night, am I really an alcoholic? You know, um, and by you saying, you know, in this that, um, you know, it is a, you know, allergy and I want more and that's my reaction bodily. And then, um, you know, my obsession kicks in and I, I forget that, you know, and you said something about the forgetter, you know, we have this great big you know, forget her, you know, that, hey, tomorrow, I don't want to wake up with a hangover. I don't want to lay in bed. I don't want to cry all day, you know, because that's what I would do. I cry all day about all my problems. And it to me, it's like a, uh, a 
a medicine on Friday night, you know, to get rid of all my craziness. So anyway, I, um, you know, I am an alcoholic because I do, when I start drinking wine, I will drink seven glasses of wine and then black out and go to bed. But then I start saying, am I really an alcoholic? Because I'm just hurting myself. Yeah. Um, so with that, you know, I compared a lot when I came in. I never was a morning drinker. I was never an everyday drinker. But we can't compare our drinking careers to other people's. This is where it's great that it's a self-diagnosis. I have the allergy. Once I start drinking, I can't control how much I have. And then when I tried to stop altogether, not going to drink for the whole month of January. January 1st at 5 p.m. I'm drinking. Like I couldn't even go a week into January, right? So, and I see all the nods happening. You know, if that's the thing, if, if you only drink on Fridays, try not to drink on Friday for the next month. There's your exploration, right? And it'll tell you, you can't. It'll be Wednesday and you'll convince yourself, well, I didn't drink on Friday and I'm okay, so I'm going to drink on Wednesday. It'll progress. It will. I've heard it. I've experienced it. I'm seeing all the heads nodding, so they've experienced too. So we're going to continue on, but the point of meditation is if, excuse me, <coughs> just a cough, not COVID. Um, if you're doing this and you're following along as a set of steps, please, please, please sit in meditation and really digest what we read today. Um, so that's page 30, 31, 32, and 33. Look for lurking notions. Think if you have any reservations. When you say, I am an alcoholic. I can concede to myself that I am an alcoholic. If I drink, I will die. If you have to add anything to that statement, like, oh, I've got a health issue. Oh, I've got trouble with my boyfriend. Oh, but work. If you're adding anything to that, you've got a lurking notion and a reservation. We need to talk about it. So we will talk about that stuff next time. And if you're listening along at home or you're not going to be here next time, please reach out to somebody. Um, if you don't have a sponsor, find a temporary sponsor or a responsible member. And just talk to them about what we're doing so that you can bounce your thoughts off them. Thank you.